Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andy, and thank you very much to everyone from the local branch and from the uh, PTS for uh, inviting me. I'm just going to uh, share my screen uh, now. Um, so just bear with me a moment. Um, and there may be a slight hiatus. Um, if somebody could give me a thumbs up if they can see my slides, that would be much appreciated. Not at the moment, Mark. I, I have a okay. blank screen. Okay, it, it may take a little while. I think with my students, it usually takes about 40 seconds. For it. You're now on. Right, okay. Right, thank you very much um, for letting me know that. Okay. Um, so thanks very much for the invitation. I'm sorry that we have to be doing it remotely. Um, when Andy invited me, must be about a year ago, um, we were hopeful that by this stage, we'd be able to do things in person, but unfortunately that is not the case. Uh, and that explains not only um, the fact that we're doing this online, but also my rather alarming uh, lockdown hair. I live in a rather rural part of uh, South Wales and arranging a haircut is quite difficult at the moment. Um, anyway, in terms of the topic that I've chosen for this evening, when uh, Andy and I settled on a date, the 11th of May, um, there was only one thing that we could talk about. Uh, and that requires me to ask you to tra travel back in time, 1,691 years exactly, um, to the 11th of May in the year 330, um, to the meeting of um, uh, Europe, and Asia uh, at the uh, site of the city of Constantinople, uh, shown here in a uh, reconstruction uh, of um, showing it in, in its uh, at its fifth century uh, stage of development. Uh, I quite like this reconstruction, not least because the seagulls in the, in the, in the foreground make it seem very Hitchcockian um, uh, in various ways. Now, on the 11th of May, uh, 330, that was an important date in the, um, the history of uh, Constantinople, uh, because it was the date on which um, Constantinople was formally dedicated by the Emperor Constantine. So today is uh, Constantinople's 1691st birthday. So um, given the date, there was no um, doubt as to what I was going to talk about. Now, in terms of what happened uh, at Constantinople on that date in 330, um, we have an account uh, in a seventh century source uh, called the Chronicum Pascale, um, the Easter Chronicle, uh, probably produced by a member of the clergy uh, at the great church of uh, Hagia Sophia uh, in Constantinople, uh, certainly a product of Constantinople itself, um, and it is one of our more detailed uh, records of what happened uh, in Constantinople uh, that day. Um, it uh, begins, uh, the year 330 that you see there is a modern editorial edition uh, from uh, the uh, translation by uh, Mary Whitby and Michael Whitby that I'm using. Um, it begins by mentioning, you know, um, the position of the year in the tax cycle, the position of the year uh, in the Emperor Constantine's reign and the consuls for the year, uh, and then says that in this year, which was the 300 and, 301st year from the ascension uh, to heaven of the Lord, and year 25 of his reign, Constantine the most pious, father of Constantine the second Augustus, and of Constantius and Constant Caesars, after building a very great, illustrious and blessed city and honoring it with a Senate, named it Constantinople on day five before the Ides of May, so the 11th of May by our reckoning, on the second day of the week in the third indiction. And he proclaimed that the city formerly named Byzantium be called second Rome. 
He was the first to celebrate a chariot racing contest, wearing for the first time a diadem of pearls and other precious stones. And he made a great festival and commanded by his sacred decree that the anniversary of his city be celebrated on the same day uh, and that on the 11th of the same uh, month, uh, Artemisius, uh, the public bath of the Zeuxippon be opened, uh, which was near the Hippodrome. Um, so if you like it, the fact that we're celebrating Constantinople's birthday uh, today, um, we're still abiding by Constantine's uh, uh, command by a sacred dec decree. Now this uh, source is some 300 years, uh, written some 300 years after the events that it describes. Um, so there are some elements in the account which reflect 300 years of Constantinople's de uh, development. Uh, so, for example, details about the um, uh, honouring Constantinople with the Senate, uh, and particularly uh, that the city should be known as uh, New Rome or Second Rome, uh, these reflect later um, uh, aspects of, of Constantinople's development. It, uh, as I'm going to suggest a little bit later on, um, Constantinople's status may have been a little bit more humdrum to begin with, uh, and its importance as an imperial center is something that it only gradually acquired over time. Uh, so what we have here is a very seventh century understanding of what happened on the 11th of May, 1691 years ago. And it seemed to me that reflecting on um, uh, uh, Constantinople might be a useful exercise in thinking about Constantine uh, more uh, directly. Um, Constantine is an incredibly difficult emperor to make sense of in all sorts of ways, um, and uh, in particular his Christianity has uh, presented um, uh, historians, well basically from Constantine's own time uh, and there and uh, right down to the present with problems of trying to make sense of uh, what this emperor was about, uh, what sort of emperor he was. Um, there are, of course, questions about how sincere was his Christianity. Um, Tim Barnes, for example, um, sees him, sees Constantine as somebody who was vouchsafed a, a mission from God to convert uh, the Roman Empire uh, to uh, Christianity. Uh, others, particularly in the wake of the European Enlightenment, took a rather more sceptical view, uh, regarded him perhaps as a shameless opportunist, seeing that Christianity was on the rise and perhaps converting to Christianity to get those Christians to support him. Because he converts to Christianity and not least because he converts to Christianity after a major persecution of Christianity uh, in the Roman Empire, um, it's very tempting to regard Constantine's reign as a new beginning, uh, as a remarkable departure uh, in Roman history and certainly seeing uh, the foundation of Constantine of Constantinople as a replacement for Rome uh, tends to fit in with that view of Constantine's reign as a new beginning. Uh, and one of the um, real challenges of uh, Constantine's Christianity is trying to make sense of Constantine's Christianity alongside his uh, emperorship. I mean, how do we see um, uh, Constantine? Is he a Christian first and an emperor second? or an emperor first and a Christian second. And there's been quite a lot of debate about uh, Constantine in, re in recent scholarship about this. Now it seemed to me that looking at some of these questions through the, the, the lens, as it were, of, the, um, of Constantinople uh, might um, help us to appreciate some aspects uh, of Constantine's reign. So what I'm going to do um, over the course of the next 40 minutes or so um, is um, to think about Constantine's reign under a number of headings. First of all, I want to look at what sort of city um, Constantine founded. Uh, there is an interpretation that you get in sources written in, in the immediate aftermath of the foundation um, uh, that Constantinople was a Christian city. And this often is associated with the view that Constantine was abandoning old pagan Rome to set up a Christian city where he could be as Christian as he liked. Uh, but as we'll see, that's not as 
uh, clear cut. There are rival source traditions uh, about the city. There are rival images of the city. Uh, and we get very distinctive views on the city, depending on whether the authors that we're looking at are pagan or Christian. I then want to look at uh, how Constantinople fits in with Constantine's um, role as emperor, uh, rather than just thinking of it as a Christian city, thinking, thinking of it as an imperial city, uh, and looking at the way in which it fits into a pattern of emperors' interactions with cities, uh, particularly in frontier regions of the empire, and how it fits in with this tradition of, of urban foundations and urban refoundations uh, by emperors at this time. Uh, and that will lead me to consider other ways in which we might think about the relationship between Constantinople uh, and Rome. Uh, and finally, I then want to think about how reflecting on Constantinople uh, enables us to think about Constantine's um, uh, relationship with, um, uh, with Christianity. And I want to look, first of all, at some of Constantine's predecessors and their connections with their gods, and then look at Constantine himself uh, and uh, his relationship with the god of the Christians. Uh, and at the very end, uh, there will be a cameo appearance from Mr. Spock, yes, the one from Star Trek. So once you see a photograph of Leonard Nimoy, uh, that means you can uh, assume that the, that the lecture is nearly over. Right, so um, uh, probably a good way to begin before actually diving into this image of what Constantinople was is just to provide for um, anyone that needs it some uh, basic orientation of how Constantine fits into the, uh, the history of the Roman Empire. Um, to situate Constantine in, uh, in, in a context, uh, we need to think in terms of the sort of empire into which he was born. There's some debate about when he was born. Was it the 270s? Was it the 280s? Uh, we don't really know. Um, but whatever his birth date, it comes towards the end of a very tumultuous period uh, in the Roman Empire, uh, when for the middle 50 years of the third century, uh, the empire had been convulsed by a military anarchy. Uh, now, whether this is a uh, this is reflected in a more widespread uh, period of crisis is a, a matter of some debate, but in military terms and in political terms, it was a period of great instability, um, multiple emperors, uh, and indeed at various points it looked like the empire might uh, uh, permanently uh, fragment. Um, that apparent crisis was uh, brought to an end by uh, an emperor called Diocletian, um, who um, uh, revived Roman fortunes, building on the activities of immediate predecessors, uh, but introduced a new form of government known as the Tetrarchy, which is where the emperor ruled not by himself, uh, but as part of a committee. Uh, and Diocletian ruled the empire uh, with a fellow Augustus. Uh, Diocletian himself had uh, the title of Augustus. Uh, he raised one of his friends, Maximian, into the rank of Augustus, uh, and each of them had a deputy called a Caesar to assist them. So we have the emperor, the empire ruled not by one emperor, but by four. And as you can see, uh, Diocletian is emperor for more than two decades. This is a period of remarkable stability. Um, it is uh, though a period that we tend to look back on in terms of uh, not its achievement of stability, uh, but perhaps in terms of Christian history with its um, enactment of the great persecution of the Christians, which came towards the end of Diocletian's reign. Um, Diocletian was remarkable not just in terms of coming up over a period of time with this new system of government, but also uh, by uh, electing to abdicate uh, from the throne. Uh, he laid down um, his position as emperor uh, in 305, uh, the two Caesars, Constantius and Galerius, um, uh, uh, succeeded uh, to the positions of Augustus and two new Caesars uh, were um, appointed Maximinus and Severus. Uh, and it looked as if uh, at that point that there might be a sort of endlessly self-reproducing um, system of government. Uh, but of course, that's not um, uh, how things 
panned out because only a year or so after Diocletian, Diocletian's abdication, a year and two months or so, um, uh, um, uh, one of those new emperors, Constantius I, died at York uh, in July of 306. Uh, and his son, Constantine, who you'll notice has not been mentioned uh, in the uh, arrangements for the imperial succession, was proclaimed by the troops at York uh, as Constantius's successor. Uh, Constantine himself, uh, I'll show in a moment the various phases in his reign, um, is emperor uh, of various stretches of territory around the empire uh, for the next 31 years. And uh, following his death in 337, um, his, um, his sons uh, succeed him and we basically have a constant Constantinian dynasty, uh, which culminates uh, in uh, the, the reign of Julian, the last member of the dynasty, uh, to hold imperial office, um, who is known to history as the apostate, because although he's a successor of Constantine, uh, he um, switches his religious allegiance to the old gods uh, and seeks to bring about a pagan restoration. In terms of Constantine's own reign, there are a number of stages um, in his reign. He comes to the throne in 306, uh, and for the next six years, he has complex dealings with uh, the remaining members of the Tetrarchy, uh, which are primarily those in the East. Um, and he also is locked in a rivalry with uh, an emperor who claims power in Italy, Maxentius, um, who you can see illustrated in the gold coin on the slide. Maxentius then eventually overthrown by Constantine uh, in 312, uh, on 28th of October, 312, in a battle just outside Rome. Um, following that, and for the next 12 years, um, Constantine uh, was emperor of the whole of the Western Roman Empire um, and was engaged in various forms of negotiation with the emperor in the East, an individual called Licinius, again, uh, shown on the gold coin uh, illustrated on the slide. Uh, in 324, um, the relationship between Constant Constantine and Licinius was never particularly amicable uh, or never um, sincerely amicable, amicable, I would suggest. Uh, eventually in 324, they fought a civil war. Um, Constantine emerged victorious. Uh, and, and following that, uh, Constantine is emperor of the whole of the Roman Empire uh, for the next 13 years. Now, in, uh, in, so we see that Constantine is somebody who fights his way uh, to a position of dominance. Uh, engaged in a number of civil conflicts, uh, the two most important being 312 when he overthrows Maxentius and 324 when he overthrows Licinius. Uh, and both of those um, um, uh, uh, years saw major civil war conflicts um, with uh, Constantine uh, emerging as victorious. And uh, at least some of the sources report these uh, confrontations. They were um, conflicts in which Constantine uh, claimed to be fighting uh, with the support of the god of the Christians. Uh, and we can see this uh, represented, for example, here uh, in this uh, Renaissance fresco from the uh, Apostolic uh, Palace in the Vatican uh, by Giulio Romano, uh, showing uh, the Battle of the Milvian Bridge uh, the battle fought against Maxentius in 312, uh, and you can see the, um, uh, the figure of Constantine at the center. Uh, you can see some standards behind him with crosses on them, and you can see these angelic presences swooping down from the heavens uh, to assist uh, Constantine in his victory over uh, his, um, over his uh, enemies. And it's this Christian uh, Constantine that is, of course, the one that is best remembered. Um, in various ways uh, um, uh, in the centuries that follow in the West. Uh, here is an example from the early Renaissance, but also, of course, in the city that Constantine founded uh, and rededicated in, on the 11th of May, 330 in Constantinople, uh, where Constantine as founder is, is commemorated not only uh, on this annual celebration on the 11th of May, uh, but also in various depictions here. For example, in the 10th century mosaic, uh, from Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, uh, showing uh, the, uh, the Virgin 
uh, and the Christ child at the center, uh, flanked by two imperial figures. Uh, on the left, you have the Emperor Justinian uh, presenting the Virgin with uh, and, and Christ child with a model of the church of Hagia Sophia itself. And then on the right hand side, uh, you can see another emperor, and this is Constantine, uh, presenting a model of a city. In other words, presenting Constantinople itself uh, to uh, the Virgin uh, and, and Child. So Constantine's um, uh, achievement uh, and its association with Christianity uh, is, is you know, th this is how it is remembered in the centuries that follow. And in particular at Constantinople, uh, what we get in mosaics like this is a representation of Constantine founding Constantinople uh, almost as a religious act. Um, so how does this sort of 10th century representation uh, reflect the realities of the fourth century uh, in which Constantine founded the city? Um, we have various uh, sources that describe uh, the events of the uh, foundation of the city, closer in time than the Chronicon Pascale with which I began. Here, for example, we have Eusebius um, in his life of Constantine, describing what Constantine was up to and describing the city as a city de dedicated to the god of the martyrs, that is the martyrs recently killed uh, in the great persecution. Uh, Eusebius tells us uh, in honoring with exceptional distinction the city which bears his name, Constantine embellished it with very many places of worship, very large martyr shrines and splendid houses. Uh, by these, uh, at the same time, he honored the tombs of the martyrs and consecrated the city to the God of the martyrs. Being full of the breath of God's wisdom, which he reckoned a city bearing his own name should display, he saw fit to purge it of all idol worship so that nowhere appeared those images of the supposed gods which are worshipped in temples, nor altars foul with bloody slaughter, uh, nor sacrifice of, offered as a holocaust and fire, nor feasts of demons, nor any of the other customs of the superstitious. So in Eusebius's view, and this is written within two years of Constantine's death, and therefore within a decade of the uh, formal de dedication of the city uh, on the 11th of May 330, uh, we have this idea of, Con of Constantinople as a thoroughly Christian city. That, however, is not the only view that we get. And from uh, around the year 500, we have a rather different view uh, of Constantinople's foundation, which presents it instead as a city studded with shrines to the ancient gods. Uh, and this comes from a work called The New History uh, by a, a Greek author called Zosimus. And I'll talk about both of these authors in a moment. But just have a look at what Zosimus tells us. He says, uh, when Constantine had enlarged the original city, so the original city of Byzantium, he built a palace scarcely inferior to the one in Rome. Uh, hint that Rome is uh, factoring into Constantine's thinking. We'll return to that in a moment. He decorated the Hippodrome, that is the uh, arena for chariot racing, beautiful, be, uh, uh, chariot racing beautifully, uh, incorporating the temple of the Dioscuri in it. Their statues are still to be seen standing in the porticos of the Hippodrome. He even placed somewhere in the Hippodrome the tripod of Delphic Apollo. Uh, it's still there, in fact, uh, which had on it the very image of Apollo. Uh, there was in Byzantium a huge forum consisting of four porticos, and at the end of one of them, which has numerous steps running up to it, he built two temples. Statues were set up in, the, in one Rhea, the mother of the gods, and in the other, the statue of the Fortuna of Rome. Uh, so this is a very different portrait of the foundation of Constantinople. Instead of a Christian city purged of idol worship, we have a city filled uh, with pagan shrines and pagan images. What do we need to make of these uh, two sources? Well, neither of these sources uh, can be taken entirely at face value. Uh, first of all, there's Eusebius, the author of the life of Constantine, Eusebius of Caesarea, uh, as he is known. Uh, he was Bishop of Caesarea in Palestine and author of numerous um, uh, works uh, of theological interpretation, biblical analysis, and particularly works associated with history, uh, the um, ecclesiastical history, for example, and the, the chronicle. Um, 
in the life of Constantine, he presents um, uh, an image of the first Christian emperor as essentially the fulfillment of prophecy, as the culmination of history uh, and the culmination of God's plan for humankind. He sees Constantine playing a role in the early fourth century, uh, uh, a bit like the role that Moses played uh, during the period of the Exodus. Uh, and in some ways, the life is demonstrably misleading. Uh, for example, it presents the, the death of the emperor in 337 and the succession of his sons, um, Constantine II, Constantius II and Constans, as a seamless, well-planned event. Uh, whereas, in fact, we know from various other sources that uh, the death of Constantine unleashed uh, violent bloodletting in Constantinople as various collateral branches of the, the, the imperial family uh, were massacred uh, in order to guarantee uh, the succession of the sons. Um, so Eusebius uh, is a source that has some problems. What then about uh, Zosimus? Um, the history that he wrote is very clearly a pro-pagan uh, account. Uh, and interestingly, we have um, a description uh, of Zosimus' account, um, uh, uh, which was written around the year 500 uh, and based on earlier uh, militantly pagan sources. We have an, a, a description of Zosimus's working methods from somebody in a good position to tell us about them. Uh, and this was a patriarch, a, a bishop of Constantinople in the ninth century uh, called Photius. Now Photius, in addition to being patriarch, uh, was a man of letters. He was very well read uh, and he has left us an account of some 200 and uh, 280 works uh, in his personal library uh, in a work called the, uh, the Bibliotheca as it's normally known uh, using a Latin title, uh, Miro Biblion uh, as it's known in Greek. Um, in it, he describes various works, and it's quite clear that he had access to works which are now lost. Uh, and among the works that he, uh, he describes is Zosimus's history. He says, read the history of Count Zosimus, a former advocate of the Fisk. So Zosimus was a tax official. Uh, he wrote uh, history at a later stage in six books that maps onto what we have. Being an impious pagan, he frequently yelps at those of the true faith. Uh, but his style is concise, clear and pure and not devoid of charm. Uh, then after uh, a description of the contents of the work, he then observes, it may be said that Zosimus did not himself write the history, but that he copied that of Eunapius, uh, from which it only differs in brevity and in being less abusive of this uh, Roman general of the early fifth century. Uh, in other respects, his account is much the same, especially in the attacks upon the Christian emperors. So what, Constantine, so what uh, Zosimus tells us about the foundation of Con Constantinople looks then as if it goes back to this guy, Eunapius. Now, what do we know about Eunapius? Well, unfortunately, Eunapius's work is not one that has survived intact uh, from antiquity. We do have significant fragments of it surviving, um, but um, uh, we don't have the full thing. Uh, Photius, though, in the ninth century did and was able to tell us something about uh, what uh, Eunapius's work was like. Um, and he tells us that um, uh, uh, the following things. He says, uh, read the new edition of the continuation of the Chronicle of Dexippus by Eunapius in 14 books. Um, and then uh, tells us how it begins in the middle of the third century. There's a reference to an emperor called Claudius. That's Claudius II, uh, not, not I, Claudius. Um, and then it goes down to the time of Honorius and Arcadius, that is emperors in the early 400s. Uh, it then goes on to say, this Eunapius was a native of Sardis and Lydia and an impious pagan. He slanders and abuses in every way and without restraint all those who have adorned the empire by their piety, especially Constantine. On the other hand, he extols the impious above all Julian the apostate. Indeed, it almost seems as if the work was written as an elaborate panegyric upon him. Uh, so this shed some light on that account of Constantinople as a city filled with pagan shrines and pagan images. Uh, this uh, version that we get from Zosimus depends then on a polemical uh, history uh, that uh, seeks to criticize Constantine in all sorts of ways uh, and which has a pagan ax to grind. 
So the two images that we have uh, of uh, Constantinople uh, from Eusebius the Christian and Zosimus uh, the, uh, the pagan are, are sources that uh, we need to treat with a certain amount of caution. Um, uh, we need to um, uh, um, read between the lines, as it were, and try and find ways of interpreting Constantinople that don't necessarily uh, just follow uh, the Christian polemic of Eusebius uh, and the pagan polemic uh, of Zosimus. Uh, moreover, if we look elsewhere in Eusebius' account of Con Constantinople uh, and its foundation, we find details that actually corroborate some of the details found in Zosimus, but put a particular spin on them. Um, in that Eusebius, having told us that Constantine uh, purged the city of idol worship and there were no temples, uh, actually tells us that there were plenty of images of the gods uh, in Constantinople, but they were there uh, for, uh, the, uh, for ridicule. They were there uh, to be uh, sneered at, laughed at, as examples of past pagan error. So uh, he describes uh, how uh, Eusebius says, the sacred bronze figures of which the error of the ancients had for a long time been proud, he displayed to the public in the squares of the emperor's city, uh, so that in one place the Pythian uh, was displayed as a contemptible spectacle to the, to the viewers, in another the Smythian, these are images of the god Apollo. In the Hippodrome itself, the tripods from Delphi, uh, we've already seen Zosimus refer to these, uh, and the muses of Helicon at the palace, the city named after the emperor was filled throughout with objects of skilled artwork in bronze, dedicated in various provinces, these under the name of gods, those sick with error, uh, had for a lot for long ages vainly offered innumerable hecatombs that's mass sacrifices of oxen and whole burnt sacrifices but now at last they learnt sense as the emperor used these very toys for the laughter and amusement of the spectators so eusebius says well actually there were images of the gods there uh, but they're there to be laughed at so uh, constantinople then uh, presents a rather contradictory image. On the one hand, a very Christian place. On the other hand, a place filled uh, with images uh, of the gods. So what are we to make uh, of Constantinople? So let's turn uh, to uh, the topography of the city itself. Um, that's a map of Constantinople in the uh, early fifth century. Um, what you have, if I uh, just point out, you have the original settlement on the site, uh, going back to the uh, archaic period of Greek history. Uh, it's a uh, a Greek colony founded on this promontory, uh, controlling uh, maritime traffic uh, through the Bosphorus between the Aegean uh, and the Black Sea. Uh, that city, uh, founded um, uh, in the 7th century BC, uh, continues in existence right down through the Roman period and is then chosen uh, by Constantine for redevelopment uh, because it is very close uh, it, sort of, it looks across the water of the Bosphorus to the site of Constantine's victory against Licinius in 324. So it's an appropriate place to found a city to celebrate Constantine's achievement of control of the whole of the empire. Uh, you can see uh, on the map uh, a wall of Constantine. Uh, so this was the area that was enclosed uh, by Constantine during his rededication redevelopment of the city. That is the extent of the city dedicated on the 11th of May 330. Uh, but you can see that there's another set of walls. These are the best known walls, uh, the walls of Theodosius II, uh, constructed in the first half of the 5th century. So what are we to make of the foundation of the city? Well, I've already hinted that it is connected with Constantine's victory over Licinius in 324. And it fits in with what we might think of as the geography of the empire at this time. Uh, what uh, the historian Brian Ward Perkins has described as a most unusual empire, an empire, if you will, turned inside out. Um, for the early centuries of um, uh, the Roman Empire, we think of the empire with emperors based at Rome. But by the time we reach Constantine's reign, uh, the emperors are to be hardly ever found at Rome. Uh, instead, they are found uh, in areas along the frontiers. And those are the areas shaded uh, in, uh, on this map, which show where emperors were to be found. They were to be found uh, along uh, the uh, Rhine frontier, various places along the, uh, the Danube frontier, 
uh, and also in the east at places like Antioch, where you would be quite close to the frontier with the Persians. Uh, and you can see that Constantinople is located very firmly in that um, geographical uh, um, uh, area of imperial activity. Um, this is a period when we have to understand that emperors are almost constantly on the move. They're very rarely based uh, in one uh, city. Uh, and what you get is the development of various cities um, uh, around the empire as bases for imperial operations. So close to the, uh, the Rhine frontier, you have the city of Trier in Germany, uh, which is developed as a base for imperial operations. Uh, in northern Italy, you have the city of Milan, uh, which is uh, important uh, because it is, uh, you can get across the Alps to the uh, Rhine frontier and across uh, into the Balkans to the da upper Danube frontier. Uh, on the Danube itself, you have the city of Sirmium uh, in what is now Serbia, uh, also developed as an imperial base for operations. Um, uh, in northern Greece, you have Thessalonica, Thessaloniki, um, uh, which is close to the lower Danube frontier. Uh, crossing over into Asia Minor, you have Nicomedia, uh, which uh, you can get from there uh, either west towards the Danube frontier or east towards the Persian frontier. Uh, and further east, you have the city of Antioch, which is, of course, very close to that Persian frontier. So the cities that were chosen for development as imperial residence, res residences uh, and into which the development of Constantinople fits were cities close uh, to the um, close to the frontier. Uh, in time, there was some uh, uh, redevelopment. Uh, Milan's prominence in northern Italy, for example, uh, was usurped by Ravenna uh, from about 400 onwards. And of course, Nicomedia uh, was eventually um, uh, eclipsed by the development of Constantinople. Uh, but essentially what we're getting uh, are cities which are developed as bases for imperial operations. And that includes uh, having buildings in them where emperors could reside and where emperors could show off their authority and power. Now, for one of these cities, uh, the city of Trier, we have an interesting a uh, little thumbnail sketch of what that city was, how that city was developed uh, from very early in Constantine's reign uh, in a speech of praise delivered to Constantine at Trier uh, in the year 310. Uh, and in this, uh, uh, an anonymous um, uh, orator who's delivering a speech in praise of Constantine and hoping that Constantine uh, will show favor uh, to the orator's own city, which is the city of Augusta Dunham, the city of Autun uh, in, in France, uh, in, in Gaul. Uh, he describes what uh, has happened to Trier as a result of it being a base for imperial uh, operations. He says, I, I see a Circus Maximus to rival in my opinion that at Rome. I see basilicas and a forum palatial buildings and a seat of justice raised to such a height that they promise to be worthy of the stars and sky, their neighbours. All these assuredly are favours due to your presence, so the fact that the emperor is there uh, is why the city is being embellished. For in whatever places your divinity distinguishes most frequently with his visits, everything is increased, men, walls and favours. Nor more abundantly did the earth send forth fresh flowers for Jupiter and Juno to lie on, than do cities and temples spring up in your footsteps, Constantine. Now, this is, of course, a very pagan view of Constantine before his Christianity is explicit. Uh, but the essential point is, is that it emphasizes the redevelopment of a city like Trier because it is the main base of operations for the emperor on the, on the, on the Rhine frontier. And this includes a palace and it includes a circus. Now, interestingly, when we look at uh, various of these cities, uh, like Trier, Milan, uh, Sirmium, Thessaloniki, and so on, we find similar developments. Uh, so, for example, here, if we look at these two plans, uh, uh, we've got the, the, a plan of Milan uh, and we have a plan uh, of Thessaloniki. Uh, both of these uh, developed as imperial residences from the late third century onwards. Uh, we can see that in both cases, uh, you have a circus for chariot racing, uh, and that is very closely associated uh, with the palace quarter. Uh, this is very clear in Thessaloniki, where the whole sector has been excavated, a little less clear uh, in Milan, but uh, most 
that scholars working on the land think that the palace is very, the imperial palace, the imperial residence is close to that circus building. And that close association between uh, a circus uh, and a palace is of course um, an imitation of the topography of Rome, uh, where in the center of Rome, uh, you have the great arena for chariot racing, the Circus Maximus, overlooked by the imperial residence uh, uh, on the Palatine Hill. So what you're getting in cities like Trier, like Milan, like Thessaloniki, uh, like Nicomedia, and then later Constantinople, is a deliberate sort of recreation of the topography uh, of the city of Rome, and in particular, this close association between palace and circus, the palace where the emperor resides, uh, and the circus, which is one of the places where the emperor appears to, uh, to his subjects. He, you know, he, he sits in the imperial box, they can see him, uh, they can uh, chant acclamations in his honor, they can also uh, petition him if they're not very happy about his, his policies. In terms of Constantinople, uh, this is pretty much what we're getting. Um, uh, one thing to notice is that the city is decked out uh, with a number of processional routes and open spaces, uh, precisely the sort of stage on which imperial processions uh, could be performed. Uh, and the focus of these processional routes uh, at the promontory is occupied by uh, various buildings associated uh, with uh, the, the emperor and his, and his presence. Uh, you have uh, the, uh, the great palace of the emperors, which probably goes back to a Constantinian foundation. And you also have uh, the, um, uh, the Hippodrome, the, uh, the circus for chariot racing. Um, so Constantinople then, um, uh, whatever else it may have been, fits in very neatly with what we know about the foundation uh, of cities as imperial residences, or the, or the redevelopment of cities as imperial residences uh, in the late third and early fourth centuries. Um, and calling these, uh, these cities after uh, the emperor um, uh, uh, themselves is, is not unknown. There are uh, at least five cities uh, named after Diocletian, five cities called Diocletian, Diocletianopolis, uh, for example, in various parts of, parts of the East. Uh, and in terms of naming Constantinople after himself, well, Constantine's sons uh, who succeed him, um, uh, uh, con uh, Constant Constantine II, Constantius II, and Constance, all uh, der derived from uh, their father's name. Uh, this is a guy who liked naming things after himself. So we can see then that Constantinople, the development of Constantinople fits in with a pattern of the imperial redevelopment of cities. Um, we don't need to think of it in terms of Constantine desperate for a place where he can be Christian uh, and abandoning old pagan Rome. Uh, and this perhaps suggests to us that we can use Constantinople as a lens through which to focus our, our thinking or focus thinking through a lens, well, focus our, our, our vision of Constantine uh, and his relationship with um, uh, with, with Christianity. Uh, if Constantinople makes perfect sense in the sorts of things that were happening uh, in the late third and early fourth century, can his Christianity also make sense uh, in a similar context? Do we, do we need to sort of distance ourselves from the sort of image that we get here uh, in this uh, mosaic from Hagia Sophia uh, and that we get in countless um, uh, depictions such as the Giulio Romano that I showed you earlier, uh, which is to focus on him as a sort of revolutionary Christian Christian figure. What if we can uh, think about him uh, uh, and his relationship with Christianity in late third, early fourth century terms? Well, let's begin with the um, uh, event which is most closely associated with um, Constantine's um, manifestation of his Christianity, which is the vision that he experienced at some point in advance of the Battle of the Milvian Bridge uh, in 312, the battle fought north of Rome, uh, at which Constantine defeated his rival Maxentius, and as a result of which uh, he became um, uh, uh, emperor of the whole of the Western, uh, Western Empire. Uh, again, we have uh, uh, Eusebius uh, in his life of Constantine. We have other accounts, but I, I quite like the Eusebius one because it 
it, uh, it presents Constantine as a, as a bit of a slow learner and sort of gradually get, coming to grips with uh, what's happening. It's quite a psychologically vivid account, I think. It says, uh, about the time of the midday sun, now this is a time traditionally in Greek literature when you get people experiencing visions. So when the day was just turning, Constantine said he saw with his own eyes uh, up in the sky and resting over the sun, a cross-shaped trophy formed from light. Well, um, I'm not going to recommend that anyone stares at the sun at midday, but if you do stare at the sun at midday and squint, you probably see, will see something cross-shaped. So, so far, so humdrum. But there's a text attached to it which said, by this conquer, uh, seeing a cross in the sky uh, in front of the sun at midday, not a big uh, surprise, but seeing a text in Greek attached to it, well, that really is something. Furthermore, amazement at the spectacle seized both Constantine himself and the whole company of soldiers which was accompanying him uh, on a campaign he was conducting somewhere. I love the sort of vagueness of Eusebius on that. He's like a student in an exam, you can't remember exactly when something happened. Uh, he was doing it somewhere. Uh, and they witnessed the miracle. So uh, Constantine was, he said, and uh, Eusebius is claiming to, to have heard this from Constantine himself, wondering to himself what the manifestation might mean. Then, while he meditated and, th and thought long and hard, so he's just thinking and thinking and thinking about this, and eventually night overtook him and he falls asleep, he's thinking so hard. And as he sleeps, uh, God's Christ appeared to him with the sign which had appeared in the sky and urged him uh, to make himself a copy of the sign which had appeared in the sky and to use it as a protection against the attacks of his enemy. So uh, effectively what we get then is that Constantine's army on the 28th of October 312 at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge goes into battle under a Christian symbol. Uh, there is endless debate about what, about what that symbol looked like, um, but um, uh, what we do have from Constantine's reign is a uh, representation uh, of um, an imperial standard with a Christian symbol associated with it. This is a bronze coin of Constantine minted ar uh, around uh, the late 320s. So actually at the time when um, uh, the city of Constantinople is being developed, uh, and it shows uh, on one side you've got um, uh, Constantine himself um, with with uh, in the, the legend that goes around the outside reads Constantinus, so Constantine, and that goes Max Aug. Um, so Constantinus Maximus Augustus, Constantine uh, the greatest of Augustus. So he, he's a guy who's quite quite confident of his, of his abilities and his achievements. Uh, and on the, um, uh, the back, you, uh, on the reverse of the coin, uh, you have a serpent, which is just a generic representation of evil um you have a standard with three dots in it which have been interpreted as being sort of schematic representations of portraits of constantine and two of his sons uh, but the crucial thing is the thing at the top above the flag uh, on the standard you have uh, the intertwined letters chi and rho from the greek alphabet which are the first two letters uh, uh, of christ's name in greek and this features as a part of the imperial regalia uh, in various forms uh, for centuries uh, to come. So there's a close association then in the way that Constantine related the story to Eusebius and the way in which um, uh, Constantine's Christianity manifests itself in iconography uh, with military success. And certainly in terms of the God of the Christians as a God of battles, we have some statements from uh, Constantine himself, which suggests that God's support put Constantine on the throne. Uh, here we have a letter that Const well, an extract from a letter that Constantine wrote to an imperial official uh, in Africa uh, in the context of um, uh, Constantine's early efforts to resolve uh, disunity in the North African church. Uh, and in it, in the letter, Constantine explains to this official why he's intervening in church affairs. Uh, and in particular, he's emphasizing that uh, as a, um, it, it's to do with his personal Christianity uh, himself. Uh, and it seems that Ilafius, the, the recipient, and there was some dispute about whether his name really is Ilafius or whether it's some other name, uh, but it's, it looks 
um, very clear from the letter that this imperial official in Africa is also a Christian. So Constantine, Constantine feels he can be quite unguarded in what he says uh, to this, this guy. He says, uh, I think it in no way right that such disputes and altercations, uh, these are the disputes in the North the African church that Constantine is at this point trying to resolve should be concealed from us. It's Constantine referring to himself uh, and Olafius, and he says, when they might perhaps arouse the highest deity, not only against the human race, but also against myself, to whose care he has by his celestial nod commit committed the regulation of all things earthly and might decree something different if so provoked. Uh, so what we have basically Constantine saying here is that, you know, if I don't resolve this problem in the church. Uh, God might think, well, this guy Constantine isn't isn't much good, so let's replace him with somebody else. Uh, I love the sort of um, uh, uh, the, 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 the the sense there that you know, what Constantine is bothered about is not just that God might be angry against humanity as a whole, but he might be angry against Constantine himself, and you know, you know, he'd be angry with me. So there's a sense here that, Co that um, uh, Constantine feels that his success as emperor, this is written only a couple of years after uh, his victory through which he secured control of the West, is all down to the, the support of the God of the Christians. It's the role of the God of the Christians in human affairs that has enabled Constantine uh, to achieve his success. Uh, also from uh, the emperor, uh, we have uh, an oration uh, called the oration to the assembly of saints which is uh, an address to an assembly of bishops uh, there's quite a lot of debate about when it was uh, when it was delivered um, um, sometime between 315 and 321 seems to be uh, and, and, and almost anything in between that uh, and even people who come out at some point and have a very firm idea of when it was um, delivered will then revise their opinion in an article that they published you know, 10 years later. But anyway, it belongs to this uh, period in between Constantine's conquest of the West and his um, later conquest of the East. Uh, and he um, he says to these bishops, he says, for my part, I ascribe to you, 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 you bishops, to your God's good will, uh, all my good fortune and that of those who are mine. Uh, and the evidence is that everything has turned out according to my prayers, acts of courage, victories, trophies over my enemies. So again, Constantine's success as emperor uh, is directly uh, attributable uh, to uh, the um, support of the Christian God. He's thinking of the Christian God as a God of battles. And that is a way of thinking about a relationship between uh, humans on earth and divine power in the cosmos, which although it is now attached to the God of the Christians, is not a million miles away from the sort of relationship between humanity and divinity uh, that seems to have been espoused by, uh, by Constantine's um, uh, pagan predecessors, even his most recent pagan predecessors, those pagan predecessors who had been involved in the persecution uh, of the Christians. So for example, we go to Thessaloniki again, um, uh, we have an arch, uh, commemorating one of the emperors uh, of the uh, Tetrarchy set up by Diocletian. This is Diocletian Caesar, Galerius. It's an arch celebrating a victory over the Persians. Uh, and uh, we have this scene which shows uh, Galerius on horseback charging down uh, his Persian opponents. Uh, and uh, in the uh, band just above Galerius's head, uh, we have an eagle swooping down from the heavens placing a crown of victory uh, on Galerius's head. Now, given that the eagle is associated with the, uh, uh, the chief Roman deity, Jupiter, this looks like Galerius crowned with victory. Galerius being granted victory uh, by uh, the king of the Roman uh, pantheon. Um, and also on the arch, we have a scene which shows um, uh, the emperors, and it looks like a symbolic representation of all four members of the Tetrarchy. Uh, you can see one uh, in armor here, uh, and then there's another in civilian dress here. This could be Galerius and Diocletian. Some debate about who these figures are. Are they other members? Is this Constantius and, uh, and um, 
uh, and Maximian, we don't know. Uh, but um, what we have is these emperors are preparing a sacrifice. They're burning incense on an altar, which is the traditional beginning of Roman sacrificial uh, ritual. Uh, and over here, you can see, for example, uh, an ox being prepared uh, uh, for slaughter uh, at, this, um, uh, uh, at this sacrifice. <coughs> Bless you. Um, sorry, I, I would cough too if I was around uh, smoking incense coming from an altar. Right, um, that, those sort of images are, are not just found on monumental works of art, uh, but also in um, items that would circulate more broadly. Here's a, a coin of Diocletian, for example, uh, which shows on its reverse uh, a scene of sacrifice. You can uh, have, there's a little tripod here with a dish on it, um, which, is where, which is a brazier. You have four figures, one, two, three, and four, once you get four figures on a coin of Diocletian, you can be pretty sure that these are the four emperors of the Tetrarchy. So they're offering, um, uh, um, uh, uh, they're beginning a sacrificial ritual. Uh, and in the background is a building with, um, with crenellations. So this is a, a, a fortress behind them. Then you have the, uh, the legend around the outside, which goes, uh, uh, virtus militum, so the, uh, the, the virtue of strength of, of, of the troops. Uh, again, there seems to be a shorthand here uh, indicating that sacrifice to the gods uh, will bring um, uh, goodwill towards Diocletian uh, and his troops, and indeed the troops of all members of the Tetrarchy. Uh, and in the context of the Great Persecution, we get similar um, uh, ideas that uh, piety towards the gods will result in the security of the emperors, uh, as we can get in, the, for example, in this uh, account of a uh, the um, uh, the martyrdom of a Christian in North Africa called Crispina, uh, martyred in 304. Uh, she's dragged behind uh, in front of the um, uh, the proconsul, the uh, the governor of uh, of the province, Anulinus. Uh, who says, "Don't you know anything of the sacred command that is the law issued by?" By the emperors um, uh, ordering everyone in the empire to perform sacrifice uh, for the goodwill, for, for the continued goodwill of the gods towards the empire. Uh, Crispina, like most, most Christian martyrs, all often profess that they, don't, they haven't heard the news. Uh, Chris, so Crispina goes, oh no, I don't know what's been commanded. Uh, and then Anulinus spells it out. He says that you should make sacrifice to all our gods for the well-being of the emperors, according to the law issued by our noble lords, the pious Augusti, Diocletian and Maximian, and the most noble Caesars, Constantius and Galerius. Uh, so what we can see uh, under uh, Constantine's immediate predecessors is a very similar um, association between uh, piety and imperial success. Where Constantine is different, of course, uh, is in making uh, the focus of that piety the god of the Christians, but that doesn't mean it's any less sincere. Uh, so in various ways then, um, if we think about Constantinople as a typically fourth century uh, or late third, early fourth century uh, imperial act, it perhaps helps us to think uh, about, uh, about Constantine's um, uh, Christianity. Um, in that it encourages us to see Constantine as an emperor whose patterns of behavior are firmly rooted in the way that emperors conduct themselves in the late third and early fourth uh, centuries. Um, and that in many ways, the logic of his view of the Christian God as a, as a God of battles, a God who supports him, and therefore who demands acts of, uh, of ostentatious piety and acts of um, intervention in the church by way of return, actually follows that pattern uh, relatively closely. Uh, and I want to finish with one final example, um, which uh, just reminds us of how surprising in some ways uh, Constantine is. Uh, and it brings me back very firmly to Constantinople. Uh, and um, what we have here is a depiction of Constantinople in this uh, medieval copy of a late Roman map known as the Poitinger map. Uh, you can see Constantinople represented here. Uh, this is the personification uh, of Constantinople seated on a throne. Uh, but it's this structure here, this column uh, with a figure standing on top of it that I want to draw attention to. We can be quite clear that this is Constantinople 
because on the map it says Constantinopolis uh, beside it. So clearly Constantinople uh, that we're dealing with here. Um, the, uh, what we have is um, a depiction here of a monument set up by Constantine himself, uh, described for us again in the text with which I began the Chronicon Pascale. Uh, and this describing building work in advance of the formal dedication of Constantinople in 328. Uh, he says, uh, Constantine also built a forum uh, which was large and exceedingly fine. Uh, and he set uh, in the middle uh, of uh, a great porphyry column uh, of Theban stone worthy of admiration. And he set on top of the column, uh, uh, sorry, there should be a great, not a grat statue of himself uh, with rays of light on his head, a work of bronze, which he had brought from Phrygia. Now, in terms of uh, what uh, this monument is, uh, the, uh, the porphyry column still survives. Uh, this was a column set up at the center of a forum, uh, which was known um, uh, as the Forum of Constantine. So again, an emphasis on Constantinople as a city uh, for um, uh, imperial display, albeit now by a Christian emperor. Uh, but perhaps the most striking thing on top is that statue. This is a bronze statue brought from elsewhere in the empire. It looks like a, an earlier um, uh, 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 statue, exactly of whom we don't know. Um, and we have quite a lot of descriptions of this statue in later Byzantine sources, uh, which have, have enabled um, a reconstruction of this representation of Constantine. Uh, one thing that's clear from that depiction on the map is that it looks like he's nude. Um, so I'm now um, going to show you a, a reconstruction of what this might have looked like. Um, this is a suggestion of what this image of the first Christian emperor looked like. A, a heroic nude statue of Constantine uh, with these rays of light emanating from his head. Now, the origins of this statue are much debated. Um, the um, uh, the uh, Chronicon Pascale, as I've said, indicates that it comes from Phrygia, uh, but there's quite a lot of uh, uh, debate beyond that about what, who it is uh, and what it originally represented. Uh, some have suggested that it may originally have been a statue of a god, um, perhaps uh, Apollo uh, or the sun god Helios. Um, others have suggested that it may have been a statue of a Hellenistic king. Either way, it was a uh, it was a, um, a colossal. It's a colossus. Uh, it is uh, naked uh, and it uh, depicts um, uh, Constantine in ways that perhaps, um, you know, thinking about him purely in terms of his Christianity, um, might seem a bit surprising. Uh, so, how do we make sense of this? Well, uh, this is a bit I promised you earlier. You've got. Um, uh, Mr. Spock now, so this shows us that we're right at the end. Uh, how do we make sense uh, of this sort of statue and what does it tell us about um, uh, Constantine, Constantinople and Christianity? Well, the reason I um, uh, mention uh, Mr. Spock is that um, there is a statement associated with him, which is that he says it's life, but not as we know it. Um, like most things in oral tradition, that doesn't go back to anything that was actually said by Mr. Spock, the closest is something like, it is not life as we know it or understand it, yet it is obviously alive and it exists. And uh, perhaps this is a good way of thinking about Constantine, rather than trying to get him to fit with our uh, views of what Christianity might be, think of him in terms of the way that people were thinking, both Christians and uh, imperial figures in the late third and, fourth and early fourth century to think of it as uh, not life, but not as we know it, but perhaps Christianity, but not as we know it. It's not Christianity as we know it, know or understand it. It is a Christianity that neatly fits uh, with Constantine. So reflecting then uh, on uh, the material presented here, we may then think of Constantine um, in ways that perhaps located more firmly in the late third and early fourth century uh, context than later tradition uh, often uh, chooses. Later tradition often makes uh, Constantine a figure who uh, serves a particular view uh, of Christianity, 
uh, we've seen, for example, those uh, reflections of Constantine uh, offering Constantinople as a gift to the Virgin and Child in the mosaics uh, from uh, Hagia Sophia. In the Western tradition, of course, we have Constantine uh, being the author of the donation of Constantine, uh, granting all this earthly dominion uh, to the bishops of Rome. Uh, neither of those views, I think, is an entirely satisfactory understanding of Constantine. Uh, these are views um, which look back on Constantine from a later stage and get him to fit uh, with um, uh, later conceptions of what a Christian emperor should be. Uh, what I've attempted to do this evening uh, by focusing on uh, the figure of uh, Constantine and his association with Constantinople is to try and make sense of his Christianity in a way that fits uh, with that late third and early fourth century context. Uh, and as I say, it might not be a Christianity that is um, uh, recognizable uh, to later centuries, but it is perhaps a Christianity that makes most sense of the way that the empire worked uh, in the years uh, of Constantine's reign. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Maybe the best thing we can do is um, remain muted and then uh, unmute to ask a question um, and then mute again. Um, we can try and use the little blue hand. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but I, um, I, I now leave the floor open. So if someone wants to ask a question, please do unmute yourself and, and fire away. And maybe maybe I can be rude and, and you usurp the first place. Um, I, I'm just thinking about um, what you were saying, Mark. I mean, I, I know that you focused and, and rightly on, on Constantinople, the city itself. I just wonder if you could say a little bit more about something which I, I, has always intrigued me. What is Constantine's relationship with his bishops? Uh, it seems to me that one of the, the strange things, and, and I very much agree that, that we should see Constantine as feeling his way with Christianity at this point, is that this is for the very first time the Roman emperor joins something where he's not at the very top. Um, and it's just intriguing to know how he resolves that problem. I mean, can a bishop tell the emperor what to do? Um, it is a difficult one, um, and um, I think in, in, in many respects, um, the, you know, you're absolutely right, this is something completely new. Um, the, the, the emperor is not an arbiter of faith in the way that uh, um, a, a bishop is. The, the emperor doesn't you know, have a, um, a role in, the, in communicating the truth that, 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 that the clergy do in, in a way of you know, guaranteeing individual salvation. Um, in terms of his relationship with the bishops, he, um, he you know, from, from the first moment we see him engaging with the bishops, which is, I suppose, the, the church councils co called to co deal with the, the African crisis that comes to his attention in 312, is that he defers to, to Episcopal um, uh, councils. You know, he, you know, first of all, suggests that there should be a council uh, in Rome under the uh, presidency of the Bishop of Rome, um, where they can resolve their issues there. Um, there are, um, uh, that doesn't work. So, and this is why he's writing to uh, this Christian official is that there's going to be another council this time in Arles, uh, but that doesn't, that doesn't um, uh, resolve things either. So the, the problem of the of the, the, the schism in the North African church uh, you know, continues and indeed continues long beyond Constantine's time. Um, uh, we also get glimpses of him um, dealing uh, with bishops, of course, in, in connection with the, um, the Council of Nicaea uh, following uh, the victory in 324. So we have the Council in 325. Um, part of the problem with the Council of Nicaea is that the source tradition for it is is a bit ropey, um, and of course, in in um, uh, uh, Eusebius's view, uh, Constantine continues to play this almost mosaic role of this sort of deliverer. It, it's under his um, uh, under his uh, guidance, you know, inspired by divine wisdom that the council is brought together. Um, and in terms of what may have gone on at the Council of Nicaea, there's a great deal of debate. Uh, about you know what happened there and about Constantine's role in it and uh, the extent to which uh, you know, uh, bishops will have continued to um, uh, to 
uh, sort of guide the debate. And I, I imagine that the bishops must have continued to, 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 to guide the debate. Um, one of the things that is clear is that Constantine is uh, not afraid to change his mind on theological issues. He, he can be persuaded that you know, something that he agreed on in 325 is not what he agrees to in, in 337. And certainly in terms of what happened at Nicaea, uh, the people who found themselves out of favour in 325 were back in favour by the time of Constantine's death. Um, and uh, so, for example, one of the um, uh, one of the winners, if you like, uh, of the Council of Nicaea is Peter of Alexandria, the Bishop of Alexandria, in whose sit in whose church you have this priest called Arius, who is promoting these um, ideas about the relationship between um, uh, God the Father and God the Son. Uh, Peter is on the winning side um, by. Uh, in, in 325, but by 337, his successor, Athanasius, is on the losing side. I mean, uh, Athanasius has been exiled by Constantine from Alexandria. Um, he's been kicked out of the, of the bishopric and replaced with uh, a bishop of, of very different um, uh, uh, sort of theological opinions. And this happens quite, quite a lot to Athens. He spends most of his time uh, either in exile in other parts of the empire um, or whatever, or, or, or within Egypt. Um, interestingly, in the accusations that are made to Constantine about Athanasius, those accusations um, don't really deal with so much with theological issues as they say oh athanasius is so influential at constantinople that he or, or at alexandria that he could threaten the grain supply of, of fro, that goes from alexandria to constantinople um so in a way they 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 try to get him uh, or motivate him against bishops on the basis of sort of secular activities that they get involved in um so the the evidence from constantine's reign itself is um is a little uncertain, uh, not least because it's it's constantly being rewritten. I imagine that Constantine's relationship with the, the episcopate must change uh, over time. He's very deferential when he's writing. We have lots of letters um, uh, that emanate from his court. I mean, to what extent they're actually written by him or written by imperial secretaries, we don't know. He's, he, but he's very defer deferential to the bishops. He clearly um, has, has views on, uh, on some relations issues with mean, the, the oration to the assembly of the uh, of the saints goes off on a on a riff on Virgil's fourth eclogue for example at various points uh, but on 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 strictly theological matters he seems quite content to defer to uh, episcopal guidance i suppose the problem is is that who those bishops are that he defers to change over the course of his reign and in particular by the time he 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 by the time he dies his views have changed quite considerably, uh, even uh, from what they were in 325. So yes, I think he is. Um, uh, he does have diff. He, he does defer to to bishops. That, that, but there's also, I suppose, uh, and this is going off on another tangent. Uh, with, uh, how did he view himself? And there is, of course, this Byzantine tradition which sees him as a sort of thirteenth apostle. Um, and there are. Uh, I remember having. Uh, could do classes on this with Michael Whitby, oh gosh, 25 years ago, uh, talking about the burial of Constantine in this mausoleum at Constantinople, where you have a sarcophagus at the center for Constantine and um, 12 sarcophagi uh, around the outside. And, you know, so, um, so there is Constantine among the 12, and this makes him the 13th. Um, and I remember Michael positing that, you know, does it really make him the 13th apostle? Or does it make him the second something else? You know, just how elevated a sense of his own importance did Constantine have, um, uh, per perhaps particularly towards the end? I mean, uh, Diocletian's reign of, of 20 years was pretty remarkable by, I mean, Constantine is emperor for over 30 years. I mean, that level of success could turn anyone's head and perhaps make them have a very elevated sense of their own importance. Uh, and it's also been suggested to me by Jill Harris, <laughs> that by the end of his reign, uh, he might have been going a little bit gaga as well. It probably didn't help either. Um, so yeah, I think he's, he defers to bishops on, on strictly theological issues, but you know his opinions do do shift and and change. Thanks very much. Do we have any more questions? 
Yeah, I, I was going to ask, uh, before you started talking about the Council of Nicaea anyway, um, was there any parallel for that in the times of the pagan emperors? Or was it a completely new idea that he was going to call a council of the whole church? Mm -hmm. um, the, I mean, the, the tradition of, um, of bishops meeting in council goes back um, much earlier than Constantine. We have, for example, in things like the, the, the correspondence of, of Cyprian of Carthage reference to the African bishops meeting in council to discuss things and we have references um, uh, uh, to, um, to in, in some other sources relating to the East. I mean, having, having uh, provincial bishops meeting together in council is a good way of making sure that the, that, you know, the, uh, that the, that the unity of the church is, is maintained. What's different, I suppose, uh, and that habit is something that Constantine takes over with the, um, uh, the challenges facing the the church in North Africa that that come to his attention. You know, it, you know, as soon as Constantine wins a major battle, the, the next thing he discovers are, are the problems confronting the unity of the church. So, after three hundred and twelve, it's the problem of the unity of the church in in North Africa. After three hundred and twenty four, it's the problem of the unity of the church in Alexandria and elsewhere in the East. Um, in three hundred and twelve, uh, his first instinct is to call a council. Um, uh, what's different now is that, you know, whereas uh, bi bishops may have met in council before, now they, they're, they're actively supported uh, by um, uh, the emperor and the uh, imperial bureaucracy. I mean, there is um, a reference in uh, Eusebius about uh, when the, the bishops went to the Council of Nicaea, they were, they were able to use the Imperial Postal Service, that is the Imperial Courier Service, uh, to get around the empire, you know, so they, you know, they didn't have to, um, they, they didn't have to look into the Episcopal coffers and see whether they could afford to make it to that bit of Asia Minor. Um, you know, Constantine would provide, you know, um, uh, up front, you, know, you didn't have to claim back expenses later or anything like that. Uh, and that sets a pattern for what emperors do, um, uh, do later on. Um, um, to the extent that Constantine's son uh, is um, his son Constantius is 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 parodied by the historian Ammianus Marcellinus for being so keen uh, on having church councils and investing so much uh, in them that he almost hamstrung the imperial courier service by you know, because they're always shuttling bishops hither and yon uh, to attend these church councils. So so. Councils predate Constantine. What you get with Constantine is the, is the emperor actually using them uh, as uh, as a mechanism to uh, to achieve things. Um, the Council of Nicaea has has precedence in the previous twelve years because as soon as Constantine finds himself with responsibility for a divided church in North Africa, his initial response is to go the conciliar route. Mm. But as I say, the, um, the sources for the Council of Nicaea are a bit ropey. By the time you get to the end of the fourth century, uh, I mean, early, the, we don't get precise figures for um, uh, the, the numbers of bishops at the council. It's somewhere between about 200 and 300 at some point. Yeah, they, those are the numbers that seem to be hinted at. And then from the later fourth century, at a time when they really want um, constant when they really want the Council of Nicaea to have this special ecumenical status they hit on this magic figure of 318 bishops um, which is the same as the numbers of people who assist Abraham is it in the Old Testament but also the the, the number 318 um, is uh, the three is written with the Greek letter tau uh, so um, uh, a symbol of the cross and uh, the 18 is, is IE, so the, the first two letters of Jesus's name. So 318 is a great number of, of people because it links you back to Christ and it links you back uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to the Old Testament patriarchs. Uh, but that, that sort of highlights some of the problems that we have with uh, making sense of the Council of Nicaea because the, the sources are all a bit ropey. And e even Eusebius was regarded as ropey by his successors. I mean, all the... Um, uh, the successors of him who write ecclesiastical history take one look at the last book of the ecclesiastical history and go, 
that's a mess and they they all dispense with it and they they write their own versions of Constantine um, uh, because you know, Eusebius' one is, is unsatisfactory. Um, the, the Greek uh, ecclesiastical historians of the mid fifth century do this implicitly. Um, the Latin ecclesiastical historian Rufinus of Aquileia, the beginning of the fifth century, does tell us that, you know, the last book of Eusebius' ecclesiastical history is nothing more than a panegyric of, of, of Constantine. So I'm going to I'm going to condense it and then rewrite it myself. Uh, and that that again highlights the problem that we have with the sources. Mm. If I may, Mark, I'll slip one more in because I think yeah, sure. people will be interested. Um, do you see Constantine, I mean, we, we we're told, aren't we, that he sees himself as the bishop of those outside, this mm -hmm. very enigmatic phrase. Mm -hmm. yes. um, what, 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 who do you feel those outside are and, and, and what should we make of that? Um, gosh, um, that's, uh, that's quite a question to lob in at this stage, Andy, as we could be here all night debating that. I mean, there are, there are very various ways of, of thinking about any of the bishops of those outside could be, you know, um, uh, I mean, one thing that he does um, uh, uh, claim responsibility is that um, as, as an emperor and as a Christian, that enhances his imperial role and that uh, he has responsibility for Christians, not just within the empire, but wherever they may be. Um, and that actually goes back to um, uh, quite early on so after 312 uh one of the um uh, or so we're told when you know in, the, in these narrative sources one of the reasons for the deteriorating relationship between constantine and licinius is that licinius is persecuting christians and um constantine even though he's not emperor of the east sees himself as responsible for the, for the Christians in that part of the empire. And then, of course, later on, though, it's quoted by uh, Eusebius, um, this, this letter that he writes to Shapur II, the king of, uh, the king of Persia, um, saying, um, it has come to my attention that there are Christians um, uh, living uh, under, uh, uh, you know, under, under your scepter, you know, in you, in, you know, beyond the Roman frontier. Um, uh, God has raised me to this position. Uh, I am responsible for Christians. That means I'm responsible for Christians, not only within the, the empire, but also for Christians outside the empire. Uh, and he commends the Christians um, of Persia uh, to, um, uh, uh, to uh, Shapur and says, look after them. If you don't, um, you'll have me to answer to. In other words, you know, if, if you don't look after the Christians living in Persia, I'll come and look after them for you. Uh, and there is this suggestion that what Constantine is doing at the very end of his life is, is, is uh, launching a war against Persia because reports have reached him that there are persecutions happening of, uh, of, of Christians in Persia. And he's, he's launching effectively a war to avenge uh, the Christians in Persia. But of course, he never gets much further than than Nicomedia when he when he dies in 337. Uh, and that in itself is quite interesting because it shows how Christianity leads to a, a change in the, the role of emperor, both as, a, as it's perceived by the emperor and his subjects within the empire, but also in terms of how the empire is perceived from outside. The idea that the empire is a Christian state um, uh, often means that things can get a little bit ropey for Christians living outside the empire if there are hostilities with the empire. We certainly hear about that in Persia. Recent book, Constantine and the Captive Christians of Persia, which deals with it, looking at all the, the Syriac sources and the, the sources from the Persian side, which actually shed light on the, uh, the fact that I mean, there, there are sources which suggest this, that when news was coming, that Constantine was, was on his way, that Christians in Persia were praying for Constantine against the Persian king. Uh, but we also hear about it, for example, in the case of um, uh, later on, that you know, when um, uh, there seems to be a sort of um, uh, correlation between hostilities between the Romans and the Goths, and, and things getting really hard for Christians living amongst the Goths, because there were, there were, there were huge numbers of Christians outside the empire uh, already by the early fourth century. Um, and the fact that you know, when um, uh, the empire has, uh, you know, is involved in hostilities that the, the Christians living amongst these non-Roman peoples are regarded as sort of, I suppose, 
fifth colonists or you know, sort of, you know covert Roman, you know, Roman loyalists is is, um, uh, is is reasonably common. You, and you can see various emperors from Constantine onwards exploiting that as a, as a way of extending their influence, building up this sort of uh, you know what, what Obolensky calls the Byzantine Commonwealth. This sort of you know binding these peoples to um, the empire through Christianity as much. I mean, that's when you get John Malalas. John Malalas uh, talking about Justinian in the, in the five is it five thirties, two episodes, no late five twenties, talking about two episodes where kings from north of the of the Black Sea come to Constantinople to be baptized, and um, uh, uh, Justinian stands as their godfather. So that's really taking seriously a, re a responsibility for Christians outside. But there are uh, you know all sorts of ways. Of of interpreting that rather ambiguous phase, but that's that's just one one way of looking at it, I suppose. Thanks very much. Um, are we done, or is there anyone else who wishes to ask a question? Now is the time to make the move. And I think we probably are done. In which case. Um, I'd like to thank Mark very much for, for coming to, to talk to us this evening. I think we've learned an awful lot from, from that. Uh, Mark, by the way, one of the regrets he expressed was that he wouldn't be able to sample the local brews around here. And um, uh, perhaps as, as a thank you note, I could say perhaps um, Titanic's Plum Porter would be what I would recommend. All right. Um, okay, a, a, a noble brew, in my opinion. Um, th 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 this is particularly suitable because I was born in in Belfast, so anything with Titanic in the name, absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and anything anything that involves sinking anything with Titanic in the name. <laughs> <laughs> you probably know that we provided the captain in North Staffordshire. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. EJ, yeah. Who does indeed have a have um, oh, the, 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 Titanic, the, Titanic is a brewery locally launched locally and, and there is a name yeah. for Captain Smith. Um but anyway, Mark, right. uh, okay. thank you very much. And I hope one day you'll come and visit us and we well, will be able to sample these things in the flesh. I would I, I very much look forward to that. Indeed. Yes. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. As I say, it's just a shame that it has to be through um, through a screen ra that rather than in a room, um, but um, I hope you find it useful, interesting. And, well, I, I, uh, I, yeah. think, I think we very much did, and, and thank okay. you once again very much indeed. Okay.